Chapter 19 The world had not gone well with Mistress Kate Leavenworth, and she was ill-pleased. She had not succeeded in turning her father's heart toward herself as she had confidently expected to do when she ran away with her sea captain. She had written a gay letter home, taking for granted, in a pretty way, the forgiveness she did not think it necessary to ask, but there had come in return a brief, harsh statement from her father that she was no longer his daughter and must cease from further communication with the family in any way, that she would never enter his house again and not a penny of his money should ever pass to her. He also informed her plainly that the truce so made for her had been given to her sister, who was now the wife of the man she had not seen fit to marry. Over this letter, Mistress Kate at first stormed, then wept, and finally sat down to frame epistle after epistle in petulant, penitent language. These epistles following each other by daily mail coaches still brought nothing further from her irate parent, and my lady was at last forced to face the fact that she must bear the penalty of her own misdeeds, a lesson she should have learned much earlier in life. The young captain, who had always made it appear that he had plenty of money, had spent his salary and most of his mother's fortune, which had been left in his keeping as administrator of his father's estate, so he had really very little to offer the spoiled and petted beauty, who simply would not settle down to the inevitable and accept the fate she had brought upon herself and others. Day after day she fretted and blamed her husband until he heartily wished her back from whence he had taken her, wished her back with her straight-laced lover from whom he had stolen her, wished her anywhere save where she was. Her brightness and beauty seemed all gone. She was a sulky child insisting upon the moon or nothing. She waited to go to New York and be established in a fine house with plenty of servants and a carriage and horses, and the young captain had not the wherewithal to furnish these accessories to an elegant and a luxurious life. He had loved her so far as his shallow nature could love, and perhaps she had returned it in the beginning. He wanted to spend his furlough in quiet places, where he might have a honeymoon of his ideal, bantering Kate's sparkling sentences, looking into her beautiful eyes, touching her rosy lips with his own as often as he chose. But Mistress Kate had lost her sparkle. She would not be kissed until she had gained her point. Her lovely eyes were full of disfiguring tears and angry flashes, and her speech scintillated with cutting sarcasms which were none the less hard to bear that they pressed home some disagreeable truths to the easy, careless spendthrift. The rose had lost its dew and was making its thorns felt. And so they quarreled through their honeymoon, and Captain Leavenworth was not sorry when a hasty and unexpected end came to his furlough, and he was ordered off with his ship for an indefinite length of time. Even then Kate thought to get her will before he left, and held on her sullen ways and her angry, blameful talk until the last minute, so that he hurried away without even one good-bye kiss, and with her angry sentences sounding in his ears. True, he repented somewhat on board the ship and sent her back more money than she could reasonably have expected under the circumstances, but he sent it without one word of gentleness and Kate's heart was hard toward her husband. Then with bitterness and anguish, that was new and fairly astonishing that it had come to her who had always had her way, she sat down to think of the man she had jilted. He would have been kind to her. He would have given her all she asked and more. He would even have moved his business to New York to please her, she felt sure. Why had she been so foolish? And then, like many other sinner who is made at last to see the error of his ways, she cast hard thoughts at a fate which had allowed her to make so great a mistake, and pitied her poor little self out of all recognition of the character she had formed. 
But she took her money and went to New York, for she felt that there only could she be at all happy and have some little taste of the delights of true living. She took up her abode with an ancient relative of her own mother's, who lived in a quiet, respectable part of the city, and who was glad to piece out her small annuity with the modest sum that Kate agreed to pay for her board. It was not long before Mistress Kate, with her beautiful face and the pretty clothes which she took care to provide at once for herself, spending lavishly out of the diminishing sum her husband had sent her, and thinking not of the morrow, nor the day when the board bills would be due, became well known. The musty little parlor of the ancient relative was daily filled with visitors, and every evening Kate held court, with the old aunt nodding in her chair by the fireside. Neither did the poor old lady have a very easy time of it, in spite of the promise of weekly pay. Kate laughed at the old furniture and the old ways. She demanded new things, and got them, too, until the old lady saw little hope of any help from the board money when Kate was constantly saying, "'I saw this in a shop downtown, Auntie, and as I knew you needed it, I just bought it. My board this week will just pay for it.'" As always, Kate ruled. The little parlor took on an air of brightness, and Kate became popular. A few women of fashion took her up, and Kate launched herself upon a gay life, her one object to have as good a time as possible, regardless of what her husband or anyone else might think. When Kate had been in New York about two months, it happened one day that she went out to drive with one of her new acquaintances, a young married woman of about her own age, who had been given all in a worldly way that had been denied to Kate. They made some calls in Brooklyn and returned on the ferry boat, carriage and all, just as the sun was setting. The view was marvelous, the water a flood of pink and green and gold, the sails on the vessels along the shore lit up resplendently. The buildings of the city beyond sent back occasional flashes of reflected light from window glass or church spire. It was a picture worth looking upon, and Kate's companion was absorbed in it. Not so, Kate. She loved display above all things. She sat up state lily, aware that she looked well in her new frock with the fine lace collar she had extravagantly purchased the day before, and her leghorn bonnet with its real ostrich feather, which was becoming in the extreme. She enjoyed sitting back of the colored coachman, her elegant friend by her side, and being admired by the two ladies and the little girl who sat in the ladies' cabin, and occasionally peeped curiously at her from the window. She drew herself up haughtily and let her soul delight itself in fatness. Borrowed fatness, perhaps, but still the long desired. She told herself she had a right to it, for was she not a Schuyler? That name was respected everywhere. She bore a grudge at a man and a woman who stood by the railing absorbed in watching the sunset haze that lay over the river, showing the white sails in gleams like flashes of white birds here and there. A young man well set up and fashionably attired sauntered up to the carriage. He spoke to Kate's friend and was introduced. Kate felt in her heart it was because of her presence there he came. His bold black eyes told her as much, and she was flattered. They fell to talking. "'You say you spent the summer near Albany, Mr. Temple,' said Kate presently. "'I wonder if you happen to know any of my friends. Did you meet a Mr. Spafford? David Spafford?' "'Of course I did. I knew him well,' said the young man with guarded tone. But a quick flash of dislike and perhaps fear had crossed his face at the name. Kate was keen. She analyzed that look. She parted her charming red lips and showed her sharp little teeth like the treacherous pearls in a white kitten's little pink mouth. "'He was once a lover of mine,' said Kate carelessly, 
wrinkling her piquant little nose as if the idea were comical, and laughing out a sweet ripple of mirth that would have cut David to the heart. Indeed, said the ever-ready Harry, and I do not wonder. Is not every one that at once they see you, Madame Leavenworth? How kind of your husband to stay away at sea for so long a time and give us other poor fellows a chance to say pleasant things. Then Kate pouted her pretty lips in a way she had and tapped the delighted Harry with her carriage parasol across the fingers of his hand that had taken familiar hold of the carriage beside her arm. "'Oh, you naughty man!' she exclaimed prettily. "'How dare you! Yes, David Spafford and I were quite good friends. I almost gave in at one time and became Mrs. Spafford, but he was too good for me. She uttered this truth in a mocking tone, and Harry saw her lead and hastened to follow. Here was a possible chance for revenge. He was ready for any. He studied the lady before him keenly. Of what did that face remind him? Had he ever seen her before? I should judge him a little straight-laced for your merry ways he responded gallantly. But he's like all the rest, fickle, you know. He's married, have you heard? Kate's face darkened with something hard and cruel, but her voice was soft as a cat's purr. Yes, she sighed. I know. He married my sister, poor child. I am so sorry for her. I think he did it out of revenge, and she was too young to know her own mind. But they, poor things, will have to bear the consequences of what they have done. Isn't it a pity that that has to be, Mr. Temple? It is dreadful to have the innocent suffer. I have been greatly anxious about my sister. She lifted her large eyes, swimming in tears, and he did not perceive the insincerity in her purring voice just then. He was thanking his lucky stars that he had been saved from any remarks about young Mrs. Spafford, whom her sister seemed to love so deeply. It had been on the tip of his tongue to suggest that she might be able to lead her husband a gay little dance if she chose. How lucky he had not spoken. He tried to say some pleasant, comforting nothings and found it delightful to see her face clear into smiles and her blue eyes look into his so confidingly. By the time the boat touched the New York side, the two felt well acquainted, and Harry Temple had promised to call soon, which promise he lost no time in keeping. Kate's heart had grown bitter against the young sister who had dared to take her place, and against the lover who had so easily solaced himself. She could not understand it. She resolved to learn all that Mr. Temple knew about David, and to find out, if possible, whether he were happy. It was Kate's nature not to be able to give up anything, even though she did not want it. She desired the lifelong devotion of every man who came near her, and have it she would, or punish him. Harry Temple, meanwhile, was reflecting upon his chance meeting that afternoon and wondering if in some way he might not yet have revenge upon the man who had humbled him. Possibly this woman could help him. After some thought he sat down and penned a letter to Hannah Heath, begemming it here and there with devoted sentences which caused that young woman's eyes to sparkle with a smile of anticipation to wreathe her lips. When she heard of the handsome sister in New York, and of her former relations with David Spafford, her eyes narrowed speculatively, and her fair brow drew into puzzled frowns. Harry Temple had drawn a word picture of Mrs. Leavenworth. Harry should have been a novelist. If he had not been too lazy, he would have been a success. Gold hair, ah! Hannah had heard of gold hair before, and in connection with David's promised wife. Here was a mystery, and Hannah resolved to look into it. It would at least be interesting to note the effect of her knowledge upon the young bride next door. She would try it. 
Meantime, the acquaintance of Harry Temple and Kate Leavenworth had progressed rapidly. The second sight of the lady proved more interesting than the first, for now her beautiful gold hair added to the charm of her handsome face. Harry ever delighted in beauty of whatever type, and a blonde was more fascinating to him than a brunette. Kate had dressed herself bewitchingly, and her manner was charming. She knew how to assume pretty childlike airs, but she was not afraid to look him boldly in the eyes, and the light in her own seemed to challenge him. Here was a delightful new study, a woman fresh from the country, having all the charm of innocence, almost as childlike as her sister, yet with none of her prudishness. Kate's eyes held latent wickedness in them, or he was much mistaken. She did not droop her lids and blush when he looked boldly and admiringly into her face, but stared him back, smilingly, merrily, daringly, as though she would go quite as far as he would. Moreover, with her he was sure he need feel none of the compunctions he might have felt with her younger sister, who was so obviously innocent. For whether Kate's boldness was from lack of knowledge or from lack of innocence, she was quite able to protect herself, that was plain. So Harry settled into his chair with a smile of pleasant anticipation upon his face. He not only had the prospect before him of a possible ally in revenge against David Spafford, but he had the promise of a most unusually beautiful flirtation with a woman who was worthy of his best efforts in that line. Almost at once it began, with pleasant banter, adorned with personal compliments. "'Lovelier than I thought, my lady,' said Harry, bowing low over the hand she gave him, in a courtly manner he had acquired, perhaps from the old-world novels he had read, and he brushed her pink fingertips with his lips, in a way that signified he was her abject slave. Kate blushed and smiled, greatly pleased, for though she had held her own little court in the village where she was brought up, and queened it over the young men who had flocked about her willingly, she had not been used to the fulsome flattery that breathed from Harry Temple in every word and glance. He looked at her keenly as he stood back a moment, to see if she were in any wise offended with his salutation, and saw, as he expected, that she was pleased and flattered. Her cheeks had grown rosier, and her eyes sparkled with pleasure as she responded with a pretty, gracious speech. Then they sat down and faced one another. A good woman would have called his look impudent, insulting. Kate returned it with a look that did not shrink nor waver but fearlessly, recklessly accepted the challenge. Playing with fire were these two, and with no care for the fearful result which might follow. Both knew it was dangerous, and liked it the better for that. There was a long silence. The game was opening on a wider scale than either had ever played before. "'Do you believe in affinities?' asked the devil through the man's voice. The woman colored and showed she understood his deeper meaning. Her eyes drooped for just the shade of an instant, and then she looked up and faced him saucily, provokingly. Why? He admired her with his gaze and waited, lazily watching the color play in her cheeks. Do you need to ask why? He said at last, looking at her significantly. I knew that you were my affinity the moment I laid my eyes upon you, and I hoped you felt the same. But perhaps I was mistaken. He searched her face. She kept her eyes upon his, returning their full gaze, as if to hold it from going too deep into her soul. I did not say you were mistaken, did I? said the rosy lips coquettishly and Kate drooped her long lashes till they fell in becoming sweeps over her burning cheeks. Something in the curve of cheek and chin and sweep of dark lash over velvet skin reminded him of her sister. It was so she had sat, though utterly unconscious, while he had been singing when there had come over him that overwhelming desire to kiss her. 
if he should kiss this fair lady, would she slap him in the face and run into the garden? He thought not. Still, she was brought up by the same father and mother in all likelihood, and it was well to go slow. He reached forward, drawing his chair a little nearer to her, and then boldly took one of her small, unresisting hands, gently, that he might not frighten her, and smoothed it thoughtfully between his own. He held it in a close grasp and looked into her face again, she meanwhile watching her hand amusedly, as though it were something apart from herself, a sort of distant possession, for which she was in no wise responsible. I feel that you belong to me, he said boldly, looking into her eyes with a languishing gaze. I have known it from the first moment. Kate let her hand lie in his as if she liked it, but she said, And what makes you think that, most audacious sir? Did you not know that I am married? Then she swept her gaze up provokingly at him again and smiled, showing her dainty, treacherous little teeth. She was so bewitchingly pretty and tempting then that he had a mind to kiss her on the spot, but a thought came to him that he would rather lead her further first. He was succeeding well. She had no mind to be afraid. She did her part admirably. That makes no difference, said he, smiling. That another man has secured you first and has the right to provide for you and be near you is my misfortune, of course. But it makes no difference. You're mine. By all the power of love, you are mine. Can any other man keep my soul from yours? Can he keep my eyes from looking into yours? Or my thoughts from hovering over you? Or... He hesitated and looked at her keenly, while she furtively watched him, holding her breath and half inviting him. Or my lips from drinking life from yours? He stooped quickly and pressed his lips upon hers. Kate gave a quick little gasp like a sob and drew back. The aunt nodding over her Bible in the next room had not heard. She was very deaf. But for an instant the young woman felt that all the shades of her worthy patriarchal ancestors were hurrying around and away from her in horror. She had come of too good Puritan stock not to know that she was treading in the path of unrighteousness. Nevertheless, it was a broad path, and easy. It tempted her. It was exciting. It lured her with promise of satisfying some of her untamed longings and impulses. She did not look offended. She only drew back to get breath and consider. The wild beating of her heart. The tumult of her cheeks and eyes were all a part of her new emotion. Her vanity was excited, and she thrilled with a wild pleasure. As a duck will take to swimming, so she took to the new game, with wonderful facility. "'But I didn't say you might!' she cried with a bewildering smile. "'I beg your pardon, fair lady. May I have another?' His bold, bad face was near her own, so that she did not see the evil triumph that lurked there. She had come to the turning of another way in her life, and just here she might have drawn back if she would. Half she knew this, yet she toyed with the opportunity, and it was gone. The new way seemed so alluring. "'You will first have to prove you're right,' she said decidedly with that pretty commanding air that had conquered so many times. And in like manner on they went through the evening, frittering the time away at playing with edged tools. A friendship so begun, if so unworthy an intimacy may be called by that sweet name, boded no good to either of the two, and that evening marked a decided turn for the worse in Kate Leavenworth's career.